Welcome to all the women around this globe. Yes, you all are welcome. The seeker, any denomination, you're welcome to this podcast, The Women of the Bible Speak. This is your pastor, Yeti. We ended with Ruth. And now, two other names will be given to you. Deborah and Yael. And first, I'm going to talk about Deborah. Two women of valor. Judges 4, 1 to 5, and verse 31. The book of Judges is a challenging one, in part because it shows the reality of God's children wandering away from his truths, from his promises. It's a hard book to digest because up until now, we've already seen such amazing victories and blessings. God provided a way for the Israelites to conquer and enter their promised land. He knocked down the walls of Jericho before them. He gave them their share in the land following with milk and honey. He renewed his covenant with them forever, and they swore to follow him and his laws to the end of time and beyond. Wouldn't it be nice to end the story there? to witness the people of Israel remaining as devoted to God as they had been in the joyous time following the exodus or as they were at the moment of their triumph at Jericho. But the story of the people of Israel is also our story. And we know that our spiritual lives don't work that way. It don't work that way. It's it's simply not possible to live all our days in the space of those mountaintop moments. As the daily demands of life press in on all sides, we can forget just how closely we walk with God in the midst of our toughest challenges, how faithful He has always been, and how much we need to cling to His integrity and His promises. The world is constantly trying to lure us away with something else, with temporary fixes that takes our eyes of God's steady goodness. Let's face it, just like the Israelites, we're all guilty of becoming untethered from the one who has always been and always will be. The book of Judges is the account of that wandering, the story of how is Israel had all the gifts God could possibly give it and squandered them. It's also a reminder that God was always there, always giving the Israelites chances to come back, always showing them the path home, just as he does for us today. And still, as we know, and looking first to ourselves. Sometimes we dare still to say, does God still loves me? Or I fear God. Fear in a wrong way of fearing and not even knowing on that particular emotional moment or problem we have that 
there is such a guilt and we forget how much God loves us and as I said in another podcast he is exactly the same yesterday today and tomorrow he is a God that we always can run to and close ourselves up in his arms he's our comforter but I think it is in our human nature that we want to walk off the path we see that in our little children too as they grow up you see that walking next to the parents or mom or dad or the grandparents you see that they take sometimes another track isn't that so familiar right so how this this really happens I don't know but it is just in our humanity and we cannot put the blame always on our first parents we have a choice so let's move on with the judges and Deborah it's also a reminder that God was always there always giving the Israelite chances to come back always showing them the path home just as he does for us today each time the people strayed and wound up being oppressed at the hands of their enemies God provided a judge to give them leadership and guidance to point them toward repentance and deliverance whenever the Lord raises up a judge for them he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived for the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them judges 2 verse 18 it's very interesting to take the time to study the judges it's very interesting one of the guiding stars God offers his people in the book of Judges is his prophetess Deborah I have to tell you she's one of my favorites for me next to Ruth of course and I like also Esther well I think everyone has his favorites right but these are darn good strong women within the strength as they recognize God to me the words of her story leap off the pages of my Bible I find her brave and inspiring and I'm pretty sure I would have followed her into the battle this was a woman with guts and wisdom a role model for the ages in the pages of the Bible we see women playing all sorts of roles and living rich complex lives but it's not often that we see a woman as a war leader much less the soil authority of an entire nation Deborah took up the mantle of governance and led her nation to victory in the midst of some very dark days her name means B just as I say it B and how appropriate she stung her enemies but brought sweetness and refreshment like honey to her people when we meet Deborah the people of Israel are under the thumb of Jabin or Yabin one of the Canaanite kings Yabin's top military commander Sisera had 900 chariots of iron which means he outmatched the children of Israel military by a mile it wasn't even close a word about the chariots for people in the remote hill 
country of Israel acquiring the materials to build chariots would have required trade. The metal and the skill needed to make a sturdy war chariot would have meant their trading with one of the bigger powers. Egypt or Syria or even local kingdoms like Moab and Edom. Chariots like the horses necessary to drive them implied wealth in connection with the great cities. Israel didn't have either of those. So, the thought of Israel going into the battle against a heavenly fortified force like Jabin's would have seemed ludicrous. That's the context in which Deborah arose. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidot, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah's between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. Judges 4, verses 4 to 5. The office of judge required more than just the handing down of pronouncements in legal disputes. At the time, it was viewed as a spiritual role as well, and most certainly a position of leadership. And I think if we're truly honest with ourselves, we miss that in our churches. And we know very well that these gifts are given to the church. So think about that. The people would have come to Deborah for the settlement of any difficult questions or cases. Probably everything from property disputes to homicides. As the nation's leading authority, Deborah, like Moses, was expected to rule on various civil matters. She guided her people in more than one way. She was so famous in ages to come that the writer of Judges called the tree she set under the palm of Deborah. Think of how many generations the people of Israel must have kept that place in loving remembrance of one of their bravest and most unique leaders. Deborah saw the dire situation of her people and decided to act at God's direction. She summoned the warrior Barak, the son of Abin Noam, delivered some truth straight from the source, and she didn't sugarcoat it. She didn't say to him, I really need your help here. Deborah spoke with authority. The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and 10,000 from the tribe of Zebulun. Judges 4, 6. God and Deborah had a plan to draw Yabin's generals, Sisera, out to meet the challenge of Barak and his men. But Barak didn't immediately get on board with this daring stratagem. Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. Judges 4, verse 8. Like any informed Israelite, Barak knew they were badly outgunned, and it doesn't appear he was excited about taking on Sisera and his vast array of military or armaments.
How many times have we reacted like he did? Lord, I know you're telling me to do X, but I'm really ill-equipped. I can't mean that. I mean, you can't mean that. Can you? Not so far, not so far, Deborah. She knew she'd heard from God directly, and she was just delivering the message. She had total confidence in what he had instructed her to do. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. Judges 4 verse 9. Wow. I like it. Boy, isn't that an interesting twist in the story. Not only is Deborah a bold and brave leader, but she prophesizes that yet another woman will take down Sisera. Yael. We'll meet Yael in another episode. Barak's reluctance costs him a piece of the victory. Despite his hesitation, Barak relied 10,000 men from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun, and along with Deborah, they headed to the battlefield. I've often wondered what Sisera thought of these underdogs. Did he view them as foolish to attempt to confront his massive, well-equipped army? Once Sisera had them in place, Deborah confidentially proclaimed, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? Judges 4.14 And with that, Barak and his men headed into the fray full steamed ahead. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak at the end of the sword. And Sisera's alighted from his chariots and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Haroshet, Ha Goyim. I'm going to say that again. Haroshet, Ha Goyim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the sword not a man was left judges 4 15 to 16 this one wasn't even close it wasn't as if Israel squeaked out a victory and called it a day no Barak and his army off a hill people on foot no less defeated an army equipped with hundreds of chariots and war horses. The Bible says not a single man from the army under Sisera's command was left, except for their helpless or heedless commander. This was nothing short of an act of God. The miracle. Sisera's abandoned his treasured iron chariots and was forced to flee on foot. What we see in the following chapter, Judges 5, is a work of art. Not only was Deborah a prophetess and judges who had just overseen the miraculous overthrow of an enemy oppressing her people, but she was also credited with creating a victory song that is one of the longest poetic compositions in all of the Bible. Deborah and Barak, or Barak, whatever you will pronounce it, joined in a song that has echoes of Moses and the people of Israel by the Red Sea. The song of Deborah 
tells the history of Israel's wars and the power of God fighting for his people. The constant refrain of this victory song is bless the Lord and it's worth pausing for a minute to consider this phrase which is one we hear again and again in the pages of scripture. What exactly does it mean? What is the listening being asked to do when we say bless the Lord? It's the same phrase that Jesus uses when he follows to pray hallowed be thy name. We are being asked to help make God's name holy with our words as well as our deeds. We bless the Lord when we praise Him and also when we serve Him. Deborah's call to her people was a call to surrender themselves to their God in thought and deed and in word and action. The song of Deborah was also aimed outward at the kings and people surrounding them. Israel never forgot that the drama of their relationship with God was happening in full view of other nations and as a witness to them. Deborah emphasized this at the beginning of her song. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princess, to the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Judges 5, verse 3. There is an evangelistic core at the heart of the song of Deborah. Of course, Deborah wanted to strengthen and encouraged her people's faith by reminding them of the miracle God had just worked for them. But she also hadn't forgotten that what happened to Israel happened in view of the whole world. Deborah's hoped that her song would be heard by you who sit on rich carpets and to the sound of musicians at the watering places for she hoped that they would repeat the triumphs of the Lord the triumphs of his peasantries in Israel Judges 5 10 to 11 that quaint word peasantry is one she repeats a couple of times in the song. It's a way of contrasting Israel relative poverty with the wealth. With the wealth and power of the nations around it. The people of Israel were basically farmers without the kind of trade resources their neighbors or Yabin had at their disposal. But God intervened for them anyway, reaching down into their lives to work a miracle that would give them their freedom back. Something he did time and time again. Deborah sings of just how bad the conditions were for the people, how demoralized they were before defeating Sisera and his army. The highways were abandoned. Travelers took winding paths. Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose. Until I arose a mother in Israel, God chose new leaders when war came to the city gates, but not a shield or spare was seen among 40,000 in Israel. Judges 5, 6 to 8. 
It sure sounds like people had just given up. Their highways were so unsafe that they wouldn't use them. And in contrast, in the sweat gear Cicera had, not a shield or spare was seen among 40,000 in Israel. These people were down for the count. As benefits a woman of action, most of the song of Deborah is taking up with describing the courses of the battle. Deborah praised not only the tribes of Zebulon and Naphtali, who fought with their kinsman Barak, but also the tribes who volunteered to help remove Yabin's yoke. Benjamin and Issachar especially. She also heaped corn, I mean scorn, a totally different word, right? Scorn on the tribes that choose to skip the battle, Reuben and Dan and Asher, the last of whom remained on the coast and stayed in his coast, Judges 5.17. Did these tribes consider Deborah and Barak's plan and think, I don't like those odds. Think I'll sit this one out. From a practical and political standpoint, their decisions likely made sense. After all, there was little guarantee that Barak and Deborah's plan would work. Some scattered tribesmen on foot against a trained professional army with hundreds of chariots and war horses. Come on. And if the Israelites did fail, Yabin and Sisera's wrath would be scorching. Why steer the hornet's nest? There have always been and always will be people who don't want to rock the boat anytime God tells his people. Go. Judges 5.16 tells us that in the distinct in the districts of Reuben there was much searching of heart. This suggests that there were others who could have gotten involved in the effort. But who spent too much time hemming and hawing about it? Deborah wasn't going to let them off the hook so easily. Instead, she publicly called them out in her song of triumph. When we get to the battle scene, Deborah's poetry reaches a powerful crescendo. From heaven fought the stars. From their course, they fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The unrushing torrent, the torrent Kishon. March on, my soul, might with might, then loud beat the horse's hoofs with the galloping galloping of his deeds judges 5 21 to 22 notice what an extraordinary thing deborah says here at the beginning of the song she speaks to the surrounding kings and peoples she also seems to personify the stars as the source of the flood waters that boggle down those fancy chariots some scholars believe the reference is a swip or a swipe at the Canaanites' belief in astrology, with Deborah saying, So much for the stars backing you up. To her, Israel was never some forgotten corner of the universe filled with insignificant hill farmers. She knew that. In God's eyes, his people and their survival were a priority. Too often we hesitate, like those tribes of Dan and Asher and Reuben, refusing to believe God's miraculous promises. In fear, rather than confidence, we refuse to take the risk of trusting God. To take him had this unfailing word. What if we could summon the courage of Deborah, whose heart was obviously so closely aligned with God's that she doubted, she didn't doubt. 
its direction in a situation that by human standards appeared to be a death sentence? The Psalm of Deborah closes with a powerful image. It ends with a picture of Cicera's mother anxiously waiting for her son to arrive home. Out of the window she peered. The mother of Cicera gazed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariot? The wished ladies make no answer. Nay, she gives answer to herself. Are they not finding and defining the spoil? A maiden or two for every man, spoil of dyed stuffs for Cicera. Judges 5, 28 to 30. That is some hard reading. It's difficult to internalize the image of a woman sitting waiting for her son to come home from war, especially when we as readers and listeners know how Cicera's stories ends. But we have to look at the reality of what was going on there. The language Deborah uses suggests that Cicera's mother was implying that her son was out, not simply having a good time, but more specifically, sexually assaulting young women. The passage implies that the values of this woman, mother or not, was ultimately pagan. We see motherhood woven throughout the song of Deborah, first in Deborah's describing herself as a mother who arose in Israel when it seemed everyone else had given up. Judges 5 or 7. Most of the images of motherhood in the Bible are ones of nurturing, of tenderness, and protectiveness and caring. The people of Israel in the Bible are nomadic and agriculture, simple people living close to the land. Their ideas of women's and men's roles are equally simple. Men fought the wars and women took care of the children. But in Deborah's story, we see that motherhood can also be something fierce and warlike. Deborah was chosen and equipped by God, full of discernment and bravery at a time when the people of Israel needed rescuing, both spiritually and physically. But by revisiting motherhood in her song, this time via the story of a mother who would soon be grieving, Deborah makes another important point. She offers a very human illustration of the Israelites of war, and I think we can infer she was sending a message. So, so many all your enemies perish, Lord, but may all who love you be like the sun when it rises in its strength. Judges 5, 31. As Deborah and Barak led the Israelites in celebrating a miraculous conquest, they also put the rest of their enemies on notice. Hey, see what happens when the people of Israel, backed by their unbeatable God, show up for battle. Deborah's joyous celebration ends with this final line, then the land had peace 40 years. Judges 5, 31. What an about face from the moments when her story started, when we first meet her. Israel is in a big trouble. True, it earned it. The people had done evil in the eyes of the Lord. Judges 4, 1. They were being terrorized by their enemies, cruelly oppressed for 20 years. 
and they begged the Lord for help. He sent them Deborah, who led them to peace. I find such encouragement and direction in her story. It's no flock that God chose and prepared this woman. He gave her gifts of discernment and understanding that caused her to be reverent and trusted by her people. They came to her with their disputes. How many times have you been caught in that place, bickering children, disgruntled co-workers, gossiping friends? We don't have to be leading a nation to face some of the responsibilities Deborah faced. But there's something we can do. We can take a breath, listening to a frustrated friend, see God's truth, and try to lovingly bring peace to all the frustrations we encounter in our daily lives. Deborah spoke truth with confidence. She didn't try to memorize the reality of the situation, but she did choose to believe in God's faithfulness. How many of us hesitate to speak up when God has asked us to direct us to do? Do we worry about how the words will be received? That people will think we've overstepped boundaries or lost touch with reality? Deborah didn't she didn't. She had a message directly from God. And she simply delivered it. It wasn't up to her. And it's not up to us. To weather down God's perfect plans. We are simply called to follow his lead and leave the rest up to him. Where can you and I be more like Deborah in our own lives? Stepping out in faith and trusting God for the victory. Deborah wasn't tasked with pouring over battle plans with Barak and figuring out every detail before showing up how, when, and where God told her. Most of the time, we won't get a perfect roadmap for our spiritual journey either. But as one of my favorite verses promises, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Ephesians 3, verse 20. So another time, we're going to dig more in the story about Sisera and the next woman, Yael. Okay, so wonderful, right? Wonderful. Women of valor. You women of valor. Think about it. May the peace of God be with you and stays with you. And may his light shine upon you and keep you safe. Have a wonderful, interesting, thoughtful day. Take with you, Deborah. Let her be a part in your life with Christ. Be a part in your life. God's blessings. This is your pastor, Yeti. Bye-bye.